gang, what's up? Just Aaron right here, Question Period Canada. Do you guys know Senator Donald Plett? Well, he's the leader of the official opposition in the Senate, and he's been, he was nominated to the Senate by Harper in 2009. He's a 74-year-old man, still pretty sharp, dry delivery, but it would seem because he has to retire next year that he is a man on a mission. And his mission is to make sure that Trudeau is never in power or control again. He doesn't like Trudeau. And this is a deep look into every scandal that has been associated with Trudeau since he was elected in 2015. And it is thorough, guys. And he also just doesn't like Trudeau. You can tell. Let's watch some of this. It's a long piece, but every second of this is interesting. I found it so anyways. If you don't like Trudeau, you will very much enjoy watching this video. And if you happen to think that Trudeau is a good leader, a good prime minister, and doesn't have a corrupt cabinet with the NDP coalition liberal government, check this out, man. It'll make you ask questions and do some more research. Anyhow, let's just have some fun and watch Senator Donald Plett trashed Trudeau for over an hour straight, articulately. It's very organized. It's really entertaining. Let's jump in. Not many of us were here when Senator George Baker was a member of this august chamber, but uh, Senator Baker would get up and say, I have just a few words to say on a matter. I have a few words to say today on the speech from the throne, and in particular, Justin Trudeau's legacy, his legacy of scandals. Colleagues, we are now in the ninth year of Justin Trudeau's reign in power. While it will be up to historians to write some years from now what exactly should be remembered about him, I would like to take the opportunity to outline just a few highlights of the Prime Minister's legacy. In his 2015 report on Senator's expenses, former Supreme Court Justice Ian Benny wrote the following. Senators also play a significant role in questioning, criticizing, and holding to account the government in the traditional language of Sir Walter Bagehot. It falls to the Houses of Parliament to inform the nation of defects in administration and even of teaching the nation, altering it for the better, teaching the nation what it does not know. Colleagues, this is what this speech is about. Teaching the nation, telling the nation what it may or may not know about Justin Trudeau or rather reminding Canadians what the last nine years have been all about. I know some of you dream about a Senate that would be above, above partisanship. Of course, when a liberal says it means that the Senate should never, when a liberal says that, it means that the Senate should never criticize the liberals. Their definition of partisanship is this, attacking liberals is partisan but attacking conservatives is democratic debate. We will not fall into this trap, colleagues. To quote the Prime Minister himself, if the Senate serves a purpose at all, it is to act as a check on the extraordinary power of the Prime Minister and his office. That, colleagues, is what the conservative opposition in the Senate has been doing since 2015. And this is what we will continue to do as long as the Liberals manage to hold on to government. The first aspect of Justin Trudeau's legacy that I want to point out about is his record and his government's record on ethics. The motion on the speech from the throne is the ideal venue for this, as I will cover a lot of general policy of the government. Historically, the Liberal Party of Canada has always fostered a culture of nepotism and corruption. But the Trudeau Liberals are a special breed of Liberals. First, 
They are totally incompetent. So their many, many ethical breaches are a mix of goofiness, incompetence, and moral turpitude. The Trudeau Liberals are also special in their belief that whatever they do, even if it is unethical, is done for a higher cause. They truly believe they are above the law and that the ethics rules are only for mere mortals, not for them the great justice warriors. Let me quote Andrew Coyne, who wrote in the Globe and Mail last December. Liberals have always been prone to being corrupted by power, but the current crop of liberals are unique for being corrupted by their own virtue. The preening moral vanity that is a signature of the Trudeau liberals, the gratitude, as in the Pharisees' prayer, that they are not like other men, is not, alas, an act. They truly believe it to the point that they are literally incapable of conceiving of themselves doing wrong. It isn't only that they are surrounded by people like themselves. In other words, they are surrounded by people who think like them and whose first thought at all times is whatever it is they are thinking must be for the good. That was Andrew Coyne. That makes the Trudeau Liberals so inoculated to ethical breaches that they no longer even recognize them. They have been dragged, kicking and screaming, over a flaming bed of hot coals that they themselves created before they even admit that something might be wrong. Then, when caught, they would like us to forgive and forget because they mumble, I'm sorry with a little tear in the corner of their eye. We all know they are not sorry about anything. They are not even good actors. So since 2015, the Trudeau Liberals did what Liberals always do, give jobs and contracts to friends. And of course, one of the most coveted prizes is a judgeship. As soon as he came to power, Dominique LeBlanc, wrote to citizenship judges to pressure them to resign so that he could appoint liberals in their place. The media has reported that high-level judges attended pricey Liberal Party fundraisers before being appointed by Trudeau. In fact, the journalists found that over 75% of Canadian judges appointed are donors to the Liberal Party. Shocking. Wow. At least six current Superior Court justices may have paid to meet with the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister at Liberal Party fundraisers shortly before being appointed. The Minister of Justice and the Prime Minister's office had to admit that they were using the Liberal list before making appointments to the bench. Now, maybe that is why the government seems unable to appoint enough judges, because the pool of liberal supporters is getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> also, there are all kinds of trouble with the diplomatic appointments of Justin Trudeau. Remember the Prime Minister decided to fire Stefan Dion? The worst foreign affairs minister in a long time. Now, that was a good move. But the Liberals managed to bungle his appointment as ambassador, giving him two different posts. The appointment to the EU had to be rescinded after the EU protested. Now, speaking of bungled appointments of a disgraced minister, who can forget John McKellen, who was so bad, he got fired twice. <laughs> First as a minister, then as an ambassador in China. He just simply forgot that he was working for Canada and China, and not the contrary. There has been quite a number of Trudeau cronies placed in diplomatic posts. Now this should not be such a problem if these appointments receive normal compensation for Canadian diplomats. But at least nine well-connected Liberals received compensation as diplomats 
higher, above the regular pay scale, including three former ministers. Now, I don't dispute for a second that someone who has been involved in public life can make a great diplomat, and that the prime minister does not have to appoint career diplomats as ambassadors or consuls. But what justifies the fact that these political appointees are paid more than a career diplomat? Is the cost of living in Paris or London or New York higher if you are a friend of Justin Trudeau compared to a bureaucrat? I suppose it is if you want to invite Justin Trudeau to spend the night. This is a very good example of what Canadians know as liberal entitlements. Now, one of those overpaid liberals is Bob Ray, the ambassador in the United Nations, a former liberal leader. The man managed to insult a list of people through Twitter, including the British Prime Minister and the Quebec government. Is this what is expected of an ambassador under the Trudeau government? Were these tweets authorized by someone at Global Affairs? We don't know. I filed an order paper question on this, but they remain unanswered after two years. Oh yeah, we're supposed to change the rules so that Senator Gold is obligated to answer our questions. Obviously, our well-paid ambassador is anything but a diplomat, and the Trudeau government would like to have us forget about this. Now, speaking of liberal insiders, I am eager to see if former minister Caroline Bennett will get extra pay for her post in Copenhagen. Then there is the case of Dominique Barton. The former CEO of McKinsey was dispatched to the Beijing embassy after Justin Trudeau fired John McCallum. At McKinsey, Barton preached the necessity for Canada to get closer to Russia and China. And we can all see the foolishness of that. He is the last political appointment to China. Trudeau now realizes that even though he admires their basic dictatorship, the Chinese do not reciprocate the admiration for little potato. Barton is also believed to be the architect of the liberal open door immigration policy and of the infrastructure bank two of the many disastrous policies of this government. The exact role of Mr. Barton in the shady dealings at McKinsey while he was there is still unknown. This is the firm who advised Prudhoe Pharma in their strategy to get thousands and thousands of people hooked on OxyContin and has now agreed to pay close to a billion dollars in settlements over this. To trust the CEO of this organization represents at best a serious lack of moral compass on the part of Justin Trudeau. Another overpaid liberal and good friend of Justin Trudeau, David McNaughton, was the first and only ambassador that was investigated and found guilty by the Ethics Commissioner in Canadian history. Wow. Speaking of the Ethics Commissioner, following the resignation of Mario Dion, the Liberal government decided to appoint Martin Richard, Dominique LeBlanc's sister-in-law, to replace him. They didn't see anything wrong there until the public uproar forced Ms. Richard to step down. Again, to quote Andrew Coyne, they are literally incapable of conceiving of themselves doing wrong. Appointing your sister-in-law cannot be nepotism when you are a liberal. Not my words, Andrew Coyne's. After Ms. Richard left, Justin Trudeau left the position open for six months. He then appointed a career bureaucrat as interim commissioner. And after another additional six months, made this guy permanent. Obviously, the liberals do not take the position seriously. The fact that the Liberal government is by far and out the worst offender ever in terms of ethics probably explains why it is not interested in appointing someone who is not connected to them and who will do that work seriously. Speaking of agents of Parliament, you will remember the Trudeau government decision in 2017 to nominate Madeleine Melier 
as official languages commissioner, only to see the former Liberal Ontario MPP withdraw her candidacy when it came to light that she had discussed this position with key members of the Prime Minister's office. But worse than just bad appointments, the Trudeau government clearly has an agenda of starving the different officers of Parliament by not giving them enough resources to do their job. The Liberals are making sure the extent of their incompetence and corruption is not known by the public. As the Auditor General herself, uh, Karen Hogan, said, when you're dependent on getting funding from an organization that you audit, then it has an ability to impact your independence. The Trudeau government has, <coughs> has even tried to undermine the credibility of the parla parliamentary budget officer when he found out that the government policies on the environment are not worth the cost. Environment Minister Stephen Gibo attacked the PBO while Gerald Butts called him incompetent and accused him of doing real damage to the policy discussion in Canada. Liberals only respect the referee when he doesn't call their penalties. Of course, the Governor General is not part of the government, but it is the government that recommends the Governor General appointment. And it is the government that manages the office of the Governor General. Former Governor Generals have an expense account of $206,000 per year on top of their $150,000 annual pension for life. While you may have the details for expenses of all ministers, MPs, senators, and their staff, the Canadian public does not have access to the details for former Governor Generals. The Office of the Secretary to the Governor General is unable to provide this level of detail, we learned in 2021. This is not only against the spirit of open government that Justin Trudeau promised in 2015, it leaves open many questions on how taxpayers' funds are spent. Julie Payette was appointed as Governor General in 2017. She was handpicked by the Prime Minister himself after he refused to follow the process put in place by Prime Minister Harper to have a committee vet the nomination. Surprising for somebody who likes committees to help him do his appointments. She was appointed without a thorough due diligence. Now a vetting process would have shown she was investigated for running over a pedestrian. It would have shown that she was investigated for violence against her spouse. It would have shown that in all her previous possessions, she had to deal with accusations of harassment. We have learned that from the media after she was appointed. Madame Payette immediately hired her good friend as principal secretary. She requested renovations to Rideau Hall to give her the possibility of exiting the building out the back door without having to see those pesky tourists that come to visit Rideau Hall. Hmm. She managed to insult Canadians who believe in God in her first speech. And she decided to freelance in the speech from the throne. She had her plane fly her from Ottawa to Maribel, a 20 minute flight, so she could go to her cottage with meals cooked by her chef at Rideau Hall. And when the stories about her treatment of her staff became public, Justin Trudeau had no choice other than to fire this modern day Marie Antoinette. This debacle cost Canadians millions of dollars, not only with her frivolous expenses, but in damages paid to her numerous victims she left behind. If there is an appointment that would be a symbol of Justin Trudeau's legacy, it is this one, done on a napkin, based simply on the legend surrounding the individual, not her actual qualities. All spin, no real thinking, no due diligence, and disastrous results. So, in 2021, even Dominique LeBlanc admitted that, and I quote the Canadian press, Piet Fasco 
Payet fiasco shows need for stronger GG vetting process. They still could not find a bilingual Canadian to fill the job. Now this would not have been so bad if our actual Governor General was a superstar. But on the contrary, you hear about her only when media is able to learn about her lavish expenses. Like $100,000 for food on flights to Dubai. The equivalent of $218 per plate. This trip where she invited 40 friends and acquaintances cost Canadian taxpayers $1.3 million. Wow. Spending at Rideau Hall increased 11% in 2022, and we can expect a similar number for 2023. Cost of the vice regal office is now around $40 million annually. And even if this is an eye-popping amount, the Trudeau government rejected an all-party demand for more public accounting and scrutiny of Governor General Mary Simon's expenses. You have to wonder why the government is so afraid to show the details of those expenses. Not only has Justin Trudeau managed to damage the reputation of Governor General's position with mediocre appointments, but he also managed to destroy the stellar reputation of David Johnson one of the best governor generals that I can remember, yeah. in an attempt to cover up his own refusal to defend Canada from foreign interests and threats. When news came out that China managed to meddle in Canadian elections, the Prime Minister tried to hide the help he got from Beijing's communist government by using Mr. David Johnson. Trudeau appointed his family friend, his ski buddy, his cottage neighbor, and a member of the Beijing-funded Trudeau Foundation to this fake job of special rapporteur intended to legitimize another liberal cover-up. After eight months of denying clear evidence of conflict of interest, after refusing to respect the will of Parliament to allow a public inquiry, and after hiring liberal lawyers and consultants to try to legitimize this sham process, the Prime Minister's rapporteur finally did the right thing and resigned. This circus cost taxpayers millions of dollars in fees to well-connected liberals for nothing. The public inquiry is just starting, but we already know that a lot of evidence on foreign influence over the results of the last two elections was swept under the carpet by the special rapporteur. The mix of incompetence and willful blindness by the highest levels of bureaucracy when dealing with this is simply staggering. Because of government, the rot is throughout the government. Because, of course, the rot is throughout the government. Let me quickly go through a list of the greatest hits of the government scandals under Justin Trudeau. I won't go through all of them. It would take weeks. I will only go over a couple of examples. First, there are those funds given to bigoted anti-racism consultants. Yes, you heard it correctly. Folks who pretend to be against racism, but is only a facade. Laith Marouf, a well-known violent anti-Semite, received $500,000 from the Trudeau government for his work on racism. That was not an isolated incident. The Community Media Advocacy Center from Montreal also received grants, even if this organization regularly posts anti-Semite diatribes. Minister Omar El Gabra never explained how an anti-Semitic organization, which called the Holocaust a hoax and praised the killing of Jews, was invited to a Parliament Hill reception he organized and there are others like this. It is not surprising then that the Liberals are selective on which racism needs to be combated. They are funding a group called Canadian Anti-Hate Network who themselves admit they will not deal with anti-Semitism by leftist groups because they focus on hate from the extreme right. No hate on the left. 
It is not just the consultants that can be anti-Semitic. The Liberals will also hire anti-Jews in ministers' offices. A senior legal advisor to the Liberal Crown Indigenous Relations Minister shared social media posts condoning Palestinian revolutionary violence and supporting Palestinian liberation through whatever means necessary and used a hashtag calling for the destruction of Israel. There is also the case of Amira El Gwabi, the so-called special representative on combating Islamophobia, who once said that a decade of Stephen Harper as prime minister was more hurtful than 9-11. She has a very narrow focus. She sees only one type of discrimination, sees it everywhere coming only from the right side. Another high-priced liberal appointee that brings nothing and has no credibility. Let me go to another type of liberal scandal. All senators here know this. Liberals' times are always good to liberal insiders. Patronage, nepotism, money flowing to good friends and political allies. That has always been a staple of liberal governments in Ottawa. So it is not surprising that we have seen a lot of this in the last eight years. It is well known that several liberal insiders made a lot of money following the legalization of cannabis. FinDev Canada invested $43.4 million, $43.4 million in a Kenyan phone company, Mcopa. Jesse Moore, an activist from Toronto with liberal connections, was the owner of that company. The benefit for Canadians of investing in a phone company in Africa when we pay some of the highest sell charges in the world is already dubious. But losing all that money makes this ridiculous. The Trudeau government gave money to Canada 2020 to sponsor a conference that featured Liberal cabinet ministers as speakers. Canada 2020 is a self-described progressive think tank run by Tom Pitfield, a longtime friend of Justin Trudeau and husband of Liberal MP Anna Ganey, the former president of the Liberal Party of Canada. Sustainable Development Technology Canada is now known as the Liberal Green Slush Fund. More than $150 million was diverted to companies owned by board members. The board chair and the CEO both resigned. The government is trying to pretend that it was caught by surprise. But we now know that the minister was warned years ago that there was a problem here. As usual, the government is working to cover up this other scandal throwing money at consultants to prepare reports while they shut down any real investigation with the help of the NDP. And yet we always hear Senator Gold tell us, but we take this serious. The government takes this seriously. Heard it four times today. In 2020, Medicago Inc., a firm in John Duclos writing, was paid $150 million for COVID-19 vaccines that were never delivered. It received $173 million in research money, a total of $323 million in federal aid. Medicago was to build a vaccine factory, but that never happened. Once again, the Liberals, with the help of their friends, shut down any investigation into why the taxpayers paid such an amount and received absolutely nothing in return. The COVID crisis was synonymous with an open bar for sole source contracts to Liberal insiders. We will never know the extent of this. The government has steadfastly refused to give in a detailed accounting of the money spent. But because of the Senate Conservative opposition, because of the Senate Conservative opposition, over and over, we were able to learn that the consulting firm Accenture was given $208 million contract to administer the pandemic business loan program, something the public service should have done. Large part of the work was done from Accenture's Brazilian offices. The government lied about that for months on end. 
Speaking of consultants that have had it good under Justin Trudeau, the Liberals are now spending more than $21 billion, yes, billion, dollars a year on outside consultants, even though the public service has grown by 100,000 people since 2015. Justin Trudeau still doubled the amount of taxpayers' money sent to consultants. McKinsey, Dominic Martin's firm, the guy I already spoke about, received more than $100 million since his friend Justin Trudeau came to power. KMG, Deloitte, PwC, EY, they all got rich under this government. It is so bad that the Liberals actually gave a contract to KPMG to study how to reduce the number of contracts given to consultants. It would be funny if it wasn't so terribly, terribly sad. No wonder this government is morally bankrupt. It comes from the top. Katie Telford and Gerald Butts received more than $200,000 to move to Ottawa, even though they had been working for years in Trudeau's office, where? Right here in Ottawa. But I guess they moved across the street. Let me turn to what I think is the podium, the top three of the Liberal government scandals so far. And I say so far because we have no idea what we might learn about the liberal corruption down the road. There could be a book on each one of these, or at least a long chapter in Trudeau's biography. So I will not get into all the details. I'll just give you a reminder. The first scandal in the top three is the SNC-Lavalin affair. This started when the liberal snuck a change into the criminal code into the budget bill to allow the government to make deals with corporations found guilty of corruption. Again, preempting. We know there will be corrupt people, so let's find a way out for them. This came after months of intense lobbying by SNC officials and their lawyers on several liberal officials, including the prime minister's office. There were several allegations of corruption of officials in Canada and around the globe against the engineering and construction firm SNC-Lavalin. The Prime Minister himself pressured the Attorney General, Judy Wilson-Rabel, to sign an agreement to let SNC off the hook. She was of the opinion that SNC did not meet the criteria that were in the provisions added to the criminal code just months before. But the Prime Minister sent his most trusted advisor and his clerk of the Privy Council to make it clear to the Minister she better obey or else. Minister Wilson Rebold had more credibility than everybody in the PMO's office. She did not budge. And for that reason, she was shuffled off to Veteran Affairs opening the position of Attorney General to David Lametti, who did not have the same moral compass as Ms. wilson Rabel. He was just happy to be in Cabinet, so he signed whatever Justin, paper Justin Trudeau put in front of him. When this scandal became public, the Prime Minister claimed that, and I quote, he claimed, what is in the Globe and Mail is false. Of course, it wasn't false. Justin Trudeau lied, and his office tried to ruin Wilson Rabel's reputation in the media, but it did not work. Trudeau lost, I would suggest, his two best cabinet ministers, Ms. Wilson Rabel and Ms. Jane Philpott, and his trusted advisor, Gerald Butts, was forced to resign. The clerk of the Privy Council followed shortly after. A complete political mess and an epic failure on the ethics side. But the SNC-Lavalin affair was more than just breaching ethic rules. The Prime Minister made a mockery of the separation of power between the office of the Attorney General, between his office and the Attorney General. <coughs> he was so incompetent or so corrupt that he pushed aside the Shawgrass principle in order to help friends get away from criminal prosecution. 
And to get his way, he threw the first indigenous justice minister under the bus. The second member of the top three Trudeau scandals is the We Charity. You'll remember that the government signed a contract with We Charity where this organization would have had close to $1 billion to hand out to young Canadians. We Charity was an organization that had deep ties to the Trudeau family and then <clears throat> the finance minister. The Prime Minister's office and the Liberal Party, members of the Trudeau family, were paid by We Charity. Bill Morneau and his family were bought, brought on a lavish trip to Africa. One question that bothers me about the Wee scandal is why the Prime Minister and his ministers thought it was a good idea to give a third party that had zero relevant experience, one billion dollars to throw away to an undefined group of people based on criteria so loose you could fit anything into it. On the face of it, this program made absolutely no sense. It was a feel-good operation blowing money to fake social entrepreneurs. It is mind-boggling that We Charity could stand a due diligence of more than 10 minutes before one realized it was built on lies and deception. In fact, when media started to scratch the surface, We Charity House of Cards came tumbling down. But thankfully, the program was stopped in its tracks. Not because Justin Trudeau and his ministers suddenly realized they had made a mistake. No. It is because the obvious conflicts of interest were laid bare. The Liberals never thought that there could be a problem with choosing we to do this work. It is incredible that there could be these many conflicts of interest converging on one government program, and yet it didn't raise any red flags with anyone in the Prime Minister's office or around the Cabinet table. There is no explanation for this except that this government is so blinded by the brilliance of their own self-righteousness that they can no longer even recognize an ethical breakdown when it's glaring them in the face. And they can no longer apply simple common sense to a decision. You could see the Prime Minister and his cabinet acting shocked and offering up lukewarm apologies like they had no idea what was going on. You could see it in the annoyed looks that flashed across their faces when they were being asked questions by the opposition, or sometimes even by the liberal press. It was like they were offended that anyone would dare question their motives, or anything less than lily, or anything less than lily white. They are so steeped in their own self-righteousness that they actually believe it's real. The third scandal on this Pobian, Pobian podium is the Arrive scam. I already spoke about those lucrative sole source contracts that were given all over the place during the COVID epidemic. The Trudeau government blew tens of billions of dollars on all kinds of products and services, and it is now clear and clear there were no guardrails and that money was no object. The government spent $60 million on an app that was supposed to cost $80,000. The app turned out to be badly designed and flawed. Again, thanks to the work of the Conservatives, the Auditor General was called in to investigate this. Her report was damning. It uncovered a system of corruption running through the bureaucracy where bureaucrats pose as consultants where contracts are given to phony organizations, where work is done after several intermediaries take a cut. For example, GC Strategies and its partners have become multi-millionaires under the Trudeau government and admitted that they were paid up to $2,600 an hour for recruiting and doing no actual IT work. We don't know the full extent of this scandal. The NDP Liberal cover-up coalition is trying desperately to stop the media and the MPs from getting to the bottom of how Justin Trudeau gave millions of dollars to this shady two-person IT firm that did no actual IT work. And what is slowly coming out of this rotten system was not just 
for a rife scam that it permeated the Trudeau administration. We now know that the RCP, RCMP is investigating the arrive scam deals, but that is not enough. In my opinion, all sole source contracts given during COVID should be made public with an explanation as to why they were needed, why the contractor was se selected, how the price was fixed, and who authorized the contract. The Arrive Scam scandal also shows that Crown corporations and agencies are not immune to this liberal mix of incompetence and corruption. Over the last eight years, several government appointed CEOs of those corporations and agencies left their possessions prematurely and under a cloud of suspicion. The National Research Council, Via Rail, the Infrastructure Bank are examples because this government is allergic to openness, it is impossible to know why these people were let go. Speaking of the Liberal government not telling us the truth, there was a leak at Statistics Canada on the job market numbers in 2020. Bloomberg reported it and it moved the value of the Canadian dollar. Four years later, we still don't know what happened, who leaked, if anyone got rich, and if anyone was caught. I said it before, Liberal times are good times for Liberals. During the last eight years, all the Crown corporations continued to pay themselves outlandish bonuses to their executives while they were losing money or not meeting their objections. You can mention the BDC, the EDC, the Infrastructure Bank, and the Trudeau Public Service bonuses are not performance-based. They are guaranteed income. I recently received an answer on one of my order paper questions. EDC has paid last year over $40 million in bonuses. That is an average of $19,000 per employee. The worst case is certainly the CBC, where the CEO had the gall to complain about imaginary cuts to its budget, announce massive layoffs, and then give $15 million in bonuses to the top brass. Now let's look at all those MPs embroiled in scandals throughout Justin Trudeau's tenure as Prime Minister. George Hall, the Calgary MP, was caught stealing literature from mailboxes. Han Dong stepped away from the Liberal caucus in March 2023 after Global News published a report alleging that he advised senior Chinese diplomat in 2021 that Beijing should hold off on freeing Michael Colvert and Michael Spaver, detained by China at the time. Minister Dominique LeBlanc said he planned to obtain information from Canada's intelligence agency as he was tasked into looking into MP Dong's prospects for returning to the Liberal caucus. That was a year ago. Dong is still outside caucus. So either Minister LeBlanc could not find a way to absolve Dong, or he received confirmation that Dong should not be allowed back in caucus. We don't know. The common law spouse of Liberal MP Lisa Hepfner had to re repay Canada emergency response benefits that he received under false pretenses. MP Pam Damoff, a parliamentary secretary, lobbied on behalf of the Liberal Party donor opposed to Bill C-280. She went to the Agricultural Committee, even though she was not a member, and was the only member of Parliament in the House who voted against Bill C-280. One thing came out of the Arrive Scam scandal I spoke about before, the abuse by some of the programs for Indigenous people. No wonder it is now prevalent in Canada. Even Liberal MPs pretend they are Indigenous when they are not. Nickel Belt MP Mark Serry says he'll continue identifying as Indigenous, despite being removed from the Algonquins of Ontario in their recent registry cleanup. He pretends he is Algonquin, since he has been Algonquin assessed, he has an Algonquin ancestor born somewhere around 1630. Greg Fergus, 
was previously caught in an ethics violation as parliamentary secretary to the prime minister. After writing a letter to the CRTC in support of a television channel with an application before it, leading an exasperated ethics commissioner to call for mandatory training and conflict of interest issues for all ministers and parliamentary secretaries. Since his selection as speaker, he has been caught in a series of wrongdoings, apparently forgetting time after time that as speaker, he should not be involved in partisan politics. Who can forget that a former Waffen SS soldier was invited to President Zelensky's speech in the House of Commons? The Trudeau government was quick to push the then speaker under the bus for that one. But later, when it was highlighted that the Prime Minister himself invited the former Nazi to a reception in Toronto, the Prime Minister's office went strangely silent. If Justin Trudeau would apply to himself the same standard he applied to Anthony Rhoda, he would have and should have resigned. And that is only since the last election. Now let's look for a few minutes at the Liberal Hall of Shame for 2015 to 2021. Liberal MP William Amos was caught twice on House Zoom proceedings in indecent positions. Liberal MP Yasmin Ratanzi was wrongfully employing her sister with taxpayers' dollars and deliberately hiding this information from Canadians. Liberal MP Ramesh Sangha was removed from the Liberal caucus in January of 2021 after he accused multiple other Liberal MPs of supporting the Khalistani movement. Liberal MP Darshan Singh Kang had to leave the Liberal caucus in 2015 over accusations of sexual harassment. Liberal MP Nicola Di Lorio didn't show up for work for a year after he announced his resignation in 2018. Then the public found out, oh, he actually didn't resign. He still collected his salary as an MP, even if he was working full-time in a law firm in Montreal. To this, day, to this day, this situation has never been clearly explained by Trudeau and the Liberals. Liberal MP Raj Graywell admitted he racked up millions of dollars in debts paying casino blackjack and ended up resigning from the Liberal caucus in 2018 after the news came to light. Following an RCMP investigation, but after suddenly announcing he had paid off his seven-figure debts, he stayed on as a member of parliament for the rest of the parliamentary session. You may recall that Mr. Graywell was already under investigation by the Federal Ethics Commissioner at the time and was later found guilty of being in violation of conflict of interest. Then there was Liberal MP Marwin Tabara. He was allowed to run against, again for the Liberal Party in 2019 election, even though detailed allegations of sexual harassment had been made against him. After being arrested in April 2020, he remained in caucus for almost two months because the Prime Minister's office claimed they knew nothing about it. Took a newspaper article for the Liberals to kick him out of caucus. Then former Liberal MP Frank Bayliss signed one of those juicy sole source contracts with the Liberal government during the COVID epidemic. He received $237 million. Public health agency figures disclosed that more than 90% of the 10,000 Bayless Medical Company ventilators it bought were never used in any clinic or any hospital. Sadly, these ethical lapses were even worse amongst cabinet ministers. Let me give you a few examples. As there are many, I will go in alphabetical order. Anita Anad's husband was the recipient of one of those juicy COVID contracts. Life Labs received tens of millions of dollars of COVID contracts. They sell test kits. Anita Anad's husband, John Knowlton, is a director of Life Labs. The Life Labs division has received multiple contracts worth millions, 
since Anad was elected to the parliament in 2019. Navdeep Baines was industry minister and as such promised to crack down on big telcos who overcharge Canadians for internet and cell phone service. Guess what? He found a job at Rogers after leaving the government. The lobbying commissioner said she was frustrated at this, but liberals will always find loopholes that means more money for them. Then there was Bill Blair on several occasions lied, meddled into the work of the RCMP regarding the worst mass killing in the history of Canada in Porta Peak, Nova Scotia. While he was at the president of the Treasury Board, Scott Bryson tried to block approval for the contract of a Navy supply ship being built at the Navy shipyard in Quebec because he was lobbied to do so by New Brunswick powerful Irving family, owners of the rival Halifax shipyard. Minister Bryson also tried to argue there was no need for him to set up a conflict of interest screen to prevent him from participating in government decisions involving two of Atlantic Canada's wealthiest families, even though he used to chair one of their investment firms and that his spouse continued to sit on the company's board of directors. Francois-Philippe Champagne owned two apartments in London, England worth millions of dollars his mortgages were with a Chinese bank. Strange indeed for a Canadian in the UK, Canadian MP in the UK, to have to go to a Chinese bank for a mortgage. Judy Foote got involved in the Frank Norman affair. I will talk about that in a bit. But what is interesting here is that she resigned for health reasons. But suddenly her health improved and she was rewarded with the job of Lieutenant Governor in Newfoundland and Labrador. Stephen Giebel forgot to pay his taxes, but he never forgot to travel, especially to China. This minister is running around the globe, busy lecturing Canadians, but patting Chinese or Gulf Emirates officials on the back. Catherine McKenna and John Wilkinson, his predecessors at Environment, were of the same ilk, jetting around the world to lecture the common folks that they should bicycle to work. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie's office staff didn't read an email that said her department was sending a representative to a Russian embassy party. So we had a representative at a party drinking vodka with the Russian officials just after Putin had invaded Ukraine. Not reading their emails is a hallmark of Trudeau ministers and their staff. It was the excuse given by Bill Blair and Marco Mendocino and, of course, Justin Trudeau. When David Lametti was turfed from cabinet, a lot of people wondered why. He had actually, after all, done much of, the, of Trudeau's bidding, we thought. Well, in the last few weeks, we learned that Lametti cancelled a verdict of first-degree murder against Jacques Delille, a former judge, even if all the experts were against this decision. Lametti and the government refused to come clean on why he did that, even though DeLille later pleaded guilty to manslaughter. You all heard Senator's non-answers to our questions on this issue. What about Dominique LeBlanc, who despite, despite connection to the powerful Irving family, was appointed to be Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard? He had to consult with the Essex Commissioner for weeks in order to figure out how to stick handle around this very obvious conflict of interest. Then there was a time when Minister LeBlanc flew from Moncton to Montreal and back aboard a jet owned by J.D. Irving Limited. Nothing to see here, folks. But when the Ethics Commissioner, Mario Dion, found Minister LeBlanc guilty of breaking a conflict of interest act because he awarded a lucrative Arctic surf clam license to a company linked to his wife's cousin. He couldn't wiggle out of that. Speaking of Dominique LeBlanc and Scott Bryson, we still don't know what their exact role was in the Vice Admiral Norman affair. The Liberals tried to renege on a contract for a supply ship in order to give it back to the Irvings. When they got caught, they decided they would get the height ahead of Vice Admiral Norman. The Prime Minister even sent him to trial before the police had investigated its investigation. 
Scott Bryson and Judy Foote left their positions and taxpayers ended up being invoiced for an undisclosed sum of money paid out to Vice Admiral Norman. That is a first class cover up. Marco Mendocino's case was hopeless. Conflicts of interest, emails not read, bold lies in public, pure incompetence. When you are so bad that even Justin Trudeau thinks you're bad, you've hit the bottom. Someday I will have a speech just on Marco Mendocino scandals. I may need my unlimited time for that. It happens that ministers organize fundraisers outside their ridings, but when you represent a downtown Montreal riding, this is strange. It is even stranger if this fundraiser happens to be in New York. New York, USA. To my knowledge, that is the first, and this honor belongs to Mark Miller. Marianne Monsoff had to admit that she was actually not born in Afghanistan, as she had told people and led people to believe for years. Bill Morneau is another minister who was scandal prone. He started his political clear career with violating the Elections Act, for which he was fined. This is, after all, the same finance minister who forgot that he had and forgot to declare his villa in France in his ethics reporting. This is the same finance minister who sponsored Bill C-27, which happened to increase the value of pensions sold by the minister's own company, Morneau Chappelle. When the bill was tabled in the House of Commons, the value of Morneau Chappelle shares jumped, and Minister Morneau just happened to still be holding $21 million worth of shares. And as I already mentioned, his role in the Wheat Charity scandal, when he quit, he pretended he was going to the OECD top position. No one knows for sure if this was true. One thing is true and is real. Taxpayers footed the bill for his failed campaign. I still have an order paper question on the true cost, still unanswered after 25 months. It was reported in the media that this phony campaign cost at least $11 million. Mary Ang was found guilty by the Essex Commissioner for giving contracts to her best friend. In a Trudeau government, that means you pretend to be sorry, and that has no consequences. How about Seamus O'Regan? The government spent $180,000 defending him in a defamation suit. And do you remember Hunter Tutu? He had to leave cabinet to deal with, sadly, addiction issues. But what was strange was when he said that Justin Trudeau had hugged him after he revealed that he had an inappropriate relationship with a staff member. Harjit Sajjan was found to have lied about his role in Afghanistan. But this happy bunch knows how to organize a party. Sorry, a cabinet retreat. The three affordability retreats held in Charlottetown, Vancouver, and Hamilton between 2022 and August 2023 cost $1,325,000. Hey, life is better with lobster and white wine, especially when you are discussing affordability. It's not surprising to see all those ethical lapses. After all, this is the leader of an organization who sets the tone. Justin Trudeau does not believe the rules of ethics apply to him. So how could he insist that his officials, his MPs, and his ministers be any better? In 2015, we learned that Justin Trudeau was billing charities for speaking engagements, even as an MP. This was a first colleagues, a sitting politician who charges people to hear him speak. When he got caught, he said he was sorry and wrote a check. A few weeks later, he was caught again. He had charged the House of Commons for expenses that had also been reimbursed by the organizations to which he spoke. Again, we had the, I'm sorry, here's a check routine. This was a preview of things to come. 
Who can forget the thank you for your donation comment and incident where the PM's elitist and condescending attitude was on full display when he jeered at an indigenous protester before that. Before that, we had Elbowgate when Justin Trudeau pushed aside fellow MP Ruth Ellen Brazo, Brosso because he was in a hurry to vote. His time was more precious than others. And pushing aside women who get in the way is something our fake feminist prime minister does without hesitation. That was in line with Justin Trudeau's behavior in the Kokanee Grope incident where he groped a female journalist. Then he said, oh my, I would not have done this had I known that the woman was a national reporter. I guess in his mind, it's more acceptable to grope a person that is not a national reporter than one that is. Now, we all remember, of course, that our prime minister decided that this was indeed a lesson, not just for him, but for all of us. We all know that some people experience things differently, he said. Now let's not forget the three, four, five, maybe more incidents where Justin Trudeau wore blackface because he thought it was funny to pretend that he was black. We don't know how many times he did that because he can't remember. It seems that this was a classic for Justin Trudeau, the comedian, to wear blackface. What does this show about Justin Trudeau's true character? One thing we know about him is that he likes to travel. And these trips will sometimes cause problems with his international guests, often be ethically wrong, and always very, very expensive to the Canadian taxpayer. There is the case of his vacations, of course, from the Aga Khan Island to the $80,000 a week resort in Jamaica. Justin Trudeau will only vacation first class and always on someone else's dime. Last Christmas, the Trudeaus enjoyed a $9,300 a night, 5,000 square foot villa that boasts six bedrooms, a private pool, a hot tub, butlers, a housekeeper, and a chef. After initially telling the media that Trudeau would be paying out of pocket for his family vacation to Jamaica over Christmas, the Prime Minister's office admitted that Trudeau and his family were actually staying in Jamaica at no cost. Again, this habit of lying to the public. Trudeau's arrogance was on full display when he explained with a smirk that, and I quote, like a lot of Canadian families, we went to stay with friends for the Christmas holidays. I also spent a day or two with friends over the Christmas holidays. I think we ordered in some chicken. Trudeau does not use his wealthy connections only to get vacation spots down south. He gets to use a Calgary millionaire's beachfront house when he goes surfing in Tofino, B.C., which allows him to get away from it all, especially get away from visiting the indigenous people who invited him for the first ever National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Now, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister does not only enjoy water sports, his four-day ski trip to Montana last year cost the taxpayers over $230,000. I do not dispute the right for the Prime Minister to take vacations with his families. We all like to do that. But I do not recall Prime Ministers Mulroney, Kretjan, Martin, Harper going to billionaire islands while they were in office. They spent most of their break weeks at Hurricane Lake. It makes sense for the Prime Minister to go there. It's close to Ottawa, already organized for security, a bit like Camp David in the U.S. The government decided to spend upwards of $11 million to renovate Harrington Lake, including moving the secondary house closer to the lake. But Justin Trudeau does not use Harrington Lake. Why? Senators will certainly remember Trudeau's performance at Queen Elizabeth's funeral where he sang Queen songs at his posh hotel, where he had a $6,000 a night suite with a butler. Remember how Senator Gold was refusing to answer who was in the suite? Is it because of, it is because of a mistake by a staffer that we learned what we all suspected, 
It was Justin sleeping in the room. <clears throat> he spent $61,000 to attend a summit with entertainers to talk about, get this, how to end poverty. Well, when you spend $1.3 million to talk about affordability, you should spend at least $60,000 talking about poverty. Trudeau's trip to India in 2018 was a complete disaster. He brought to India an Indian chef. I guess they didn't have any out there. He invited a terrorist on the trip. He made a fool of himself by not only appearing in disguise, but trying to be more Bollywood than the Bollywood stars themselves. He single-handedly caused a rift between Canada and the most populous country on earth. One aspect of Justin Trudeau's legacy that we will need to thoroughly investigate is, why has the Vancouver Chinese community funded his campaigns in Montreal for years? Also, there is a lot to learn about the dealings that went on at the Trudeau Foundation. This secretive and nebulous organization was granted $100 million by Jean Chrétien. You would think that was enough to do whatever this small clique of elitists wanted to do. But no, they accepted gifts from shady characters. Hopefully a new government will do what it can to provide Canadians with the truth about this organization. But colleagues, one thing is clear about Justin Trudeau. He is the Prime Minister who was found guilty of breaking the Conflict of Interest Act so many times that we have lost count. The Ethics Commissioner recommended that the Prime Minister and all of his Cabinet receive a special refresher on what ethical conduct is and what is the code, what is in the code. Of course, those Liberals believe they are above the law. The rules are made for others, so they, are, they snub the Commissioner. Colleagues, I am nowhere near finished detailing the list of ethical breaches and misconduct committed by the Prime Minister, his Cabinet, and other party MPs. But even if I have unlimited time, I will stop here, because I think you get the point. Oh, no. But I must point out that all these facts are known all these facts are known because some journalists and the conservative opposition has worked tirelessly to find the truth. The Trudeau government has developed what the information commissioner called a culture of secrecy. Senators can have a glimpse of what this culture of secrecy is right here in the Senate when the government continually refuses to answer our questions that it deems inconvenient. And Canadians now call the NDP Liberal Coalition the costly cover-up coalition, because the NDP will always join the Liberals to stop House committees to investigate Liberal corruption. Here in the Senate, the Conservative opposition has managed even though we are badly outnumbered, to shed some light on all that liberal corruption. I suspect that is because that we have been as effective because that the government is I suspect that it is because we have been so effective that the government is cooking up a scheme to unilaterally change the rules of the Senate to reduce the powers of the opposition. They are so tired of us digging up the truth. We have to do something. So colleagues, prepare for that. Because that is what the leader of the government has indicated. We are going to take away the power of the opposition. We are going to take away the rights of the other. We are going to give the rights that you have to people who stand for nothing. Conservatives stand and support six million voters that voted for them in the last election. And we will continue to do our job. Justin Trudeau will be remembered as a prime minister who broke the code of ethics 
several times. He will be remembered for leading a government that considered ethic rules as mere suggestions that could be discarded in pursuit of what they thought was the greater good. Let me quote the Prime Minister again. This is what the Prime Minister said. It really sucks right now. Like everything sucks for people, even in Canada. We're supposed to be polite and nice, but man, people are mad. End of quote. That is what Trudeau said in New York last fall. Yes, Prime Minister, people are mad. They are mad at your complete disregard for rules. They are mad at your audacity to lecture us at the same time. They are mad at your virtue signaling that gives you a free pass on ethics. Justin Trudeau, you are not worth the cost. Harry Truman had a sign on his desk when he was President of the United States, and it said, the buck stops here. Colleagues, Justin Trudeau is no Harry Truman. He is trying to put blame on everybody and everything else. The Liberals will deflect, obfuscate, and lie to cover up their ethical lapses. That also makes Canadians mad. Justin Trudeau will soon leave his role as Prime Minister, either because he may finally do the right thing and step down, or because Canadians will vote him out of office. One thing is sure, these scandals will be part of his legacy. Canadians will turn to Pierre Polyev and the common sense conservatives to bring back integrity and ethics to this government and to our country. Here, here. Colleagues, I invite or I intend to cover more of what Justin Trudeau's legacy will be all about. So with that, I will move the adjournment of the debate for the balance of my time. Thank you, colleagues. After an hour and 10 minutes of seeing Trudeau getting trashed like that, do I feel bad for the guy? Hell no, I feel bad for Canadians and more respect for Senator Donald Plett. He's very fun to watch. Imagine how much effort was put into just delivering that speech. Oh my goodness. My name's Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. Like, subscribe, come and join us. We watch all the daily Question Period broadcasts. We watch that live together. Great chat room. It's fun. Come and join that. We've got uh, other short videos that we do. They're kind of fun and funny. And other videos that are fun and sometimes informative. Come and check us out. We've got some good things going on. I'm Aaron. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next video. Yep, that's it. Like, subscribe, share, get notified. Take care of business. All right. Catch you next time.